I'm Ben Tress with Bates Nursery, uh, and we are doing our Bates Nursery Botanical Boot Camp today on tree selection. Um, we'll try to keep this pretty simple and basic, um, try to touch on the basics. I mean, we can get in a lot of detail, um, and if you have specific questions, we can definitely help you out here at the nursery. So, go ahead and get to the next slide here. So, tree selection. Uh, basically, we're just going to be talking about what things we should look at when starting to, to talk about trees in our landscape, um, different options you have, uh, different reasons we're going to plant. Um, we are definitely at a high inventory point in Bates Nursery right now, so no better time for tree selection and no better time for planting. The weather's been just perfect, so uh, great time to talk about this. Great time to come out and uh, get some trees. Okay, so the number one consideration uh, when selecting trees on, on the uh, property is site. Basically talking about what's going on in our landscape. Uh, there's three main components, uh, sun exposure, space in the landscape, and moisture or water levels. Uh, with the sun, you're really gonna take note of uh, how direct that sun is. Is it filtered? Uh, are there surrounding structures or trees that are gonna cast shadow on that space? Uh, take note of any of those. We'll talk later about different levels of sun. And then space in the landscape. So you can start with bed measurements for small spaces. You can look at tree canopy surrounding trees and exactly how much space that tree has to fill in, uh, as well as some other things just to look at how that plant's gonna fit in your landscape. And then lastly, moisture water levels, definitely a big issue in our area. Uh, does the water sit in that area for more than say 24 hours? or does it stay dry? Uh, a lot of this has to do with soil content. Is it sandy? Is it clay? Uh, as well as drainage issues coming through your site. So just generally knowing how wet, how dry it stays is going to be important. A uh, few other things you can learn from looking at location, traffic and movement through the site. So if there's going to be uh, heavy car traffic or pedestrian traffic, you should take note of that. Uh, style of houses, um, you know, what era is your house built in, what's the style, uh, and what style of landscape do you have? Do you have uh, an Asian garden? Do you have more of a traditional southern garden? Or uh, what's basically going to fit with the plant you're selecting? And then also viewpoints. Uh, so standing inside your house when looking at that space, uh, what is the view from the windows in your house to this this tree area and and what is going to be the view towards your house uh, with that tree engaging so uh, looking at those viewpoints can help us uh, and looking more at the site considerations so uh, sun exposure just making this kind of simple here uh, into, into three categories full sun part sun or part shade and then full shade typically full sun is going to be six plus hours of direct sunlight so open beds areas near mailboxes, um, any area without a large structure, without a wall or trees nearby, we could consider that full sun um, six hours or more. The part sun, part shade, that's three to six hours a day. Uh, this can include filtered sun throughout the day. Um, maybe it's got a structure nearby or it's up against a wall or within the vicinity of a tree. Um, those are usually going to fall into part sun. And then shade. Um, we really have a limited plant selection going into full shade, so three hours of sun or less. Typically, this is going to be right up against a building, between a building and a tree, or uh, amongst a group of trees or in the woods. Uh, when we talk about space, um, how much room you have for this tree, we really want to let this tree grow somewhere near maturity without really engaging a building, a structure, or the other trees. A little bit of overlap is fine, but, you know, if these plants are going to grow 10 feet or 15 feet into these structures, um, that's where maintenance becomes an issue. Uh, as well as roots. So if this is going to get planted right next to a sidewalk or a driveway or say that we have sewer or septic pipes underneath where it's going to get planted, uh, take note of that. Uh, we can kind of select plants that won't be as much of an issue if, if that's nearby. Uh, as well as just a note for space with screening plants. Uh, for instance, a, a hedge 
or a row of trees to block a view, you can definitely account for several feet of overlap, uh, be it one foot or five foot of overlap, um, so that they grow into each other to form a screen. Uh, and then the watering part of the site, uh, if, if it stays wet for more than 24 hours after a rain event, uh, that is going to be a drainage issue. So we need to look at certain plants that can tolerate that moisture. Uh, sometimes you can dig a hole where the tree is going to go and fill it with water. And if it takes more than 24 hours to drain or percolate through that soil, um, there's definitely a water issue in that area. Um, amending the soil might fix it, but we also may need to plant strategically. And then also taking note of irrigation in this area or hose access. Uh, for instance, if we're planting a row of trees 200 feet from a house, water is definitely going to be a big issue on establishments. So taking note of that, um, maybe picking more drought-tolerant plants if that's an issue. Uh, just bringing up a rule of thumb about using the site, uh, this is really going to be number one factor for determining what options of trees we have. Um, light, space, and water uh, really is going to narrow down our choices quite a bit. Um, and I'm going to go through kind of reasons for planting the tree and, and trees that will fit into categories for why we're planting. Uh, number one is trees for utility. And, and this is probably the number one reason to plant. So it's, it's what is this tree going to do for me or my landscape and, and how is it going to improve an issue that I have? Uh, number one is probably fruit and nut production. Um, so that, that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, fruit trees, nut trees, or anything that provides fruit for us to eat or for the wildlife. Some people just plant a tree uh, expecting the birds or the wildlife to, to feed off of that. Screening and blocking, um, that's, that's really a popular thing, especially as houses get built uh, close to each other. Um, dense evergreens are probably the number one choice. So we're talking about um, large arborvitaes, cypresses, junipers, and definitely large hollies can, can screen both um, views and noise uh, at a certain point. So those can be used densely planted to, to screen those things. Uh, as well as consider heavily branched trees, so trees that may lose their leaves in the winter but branch so heavily that you do get a screen even in the winter uh, might be an option for you. Uh, erosion control is, a, is another use for trees. Um, so varieties with vigorous roots, we're talking willows, river birches, um, tulip poplars, cypresses, and cedars. A lot of those have very vigorous roots, and they can really stop um, creek banks from eroding, hillsides from eroding, uh, and we're really looking for things that are going to grow really fast so they can outcompete any erosion problem we have. And then lastly, shade for a landscape. Um, so using this tree strategically to make a shade bed or to shade a house um, can really reduce energy costs they can reduce watering uh, in an area so um, this is definitely something to consider what's going to happen underneath that tree with the shade uh, say in five to ten years trees for color so this is probably one of the most popular reasons um, to look for different varieties of trees um, going into fall leaf color that's what fall is all about so um, we're just getting into the season where plants are starting to change color as the temperatures dip um, below 50, 60 degrees at night, you'll start seeing some color changes. Um, some of the favorite trees that we have on the lot, there's a picture here um, on the top left of a black gum. Those are going to have brilliant fall color as, as well as good summer color. There is an autumn moon Japanese maple, which is going to be orange and yellow in the fall. Uh, those are two really great ones, as well as um, red maples ginkgo biloba uh, and dawn redwoods those are some of my favorites and, and really reliable in our area for fall color also don't forget about trees with colorful spring and summer leaves uh, the black gum is one of them we have several purple leaf red bud varieties yellow leaf red bud varieties things that are going to keep that color going through the year um, to really extend the life of your bed uh, flowers so, you know, everyone thinks about flowers in the spring. That's really when your trees are going to be showing off. Cherries, red buds, 
dogwoods. Uh, that's what that picture on the lower left is. Um, dogwoods and then crab apples, uh, which crab apples will also provide a, a fruit in the winter for you to look at. Um, those are all really popular spring blooming options. I'm sure there's numerous more. Um, magnolia can also bloom in the spring. Um, and you can see that next topic, summer, fall flowering. Typically, crepe myrtles are one of the few that are going to bloom late summer into fall. And then sometimes magnolias will continue blooming into fall, uh, especially the evergreen varieties. And, and lastly, one of the, I would say, under-considered uh, aspects of, of planting trees for color is winter interest. So we're looking at trunks. We're looking at really interesting branching habits. Um, Japanese maples, uh, there's one called Arakawa, which, which literally means rough bark. Um, so you'll get a real showy bark to it. Um, coral bark Japanese maple, which is going to go brilliant red in the fall, as well as bihu, which is going to go brilliant uh, yellow to orange. Uh, willows, those will tend to have a yellow branching. River birch has a peeling paper bark, so that can be really nice in the wintertime. Uh, as well as crepe myrtle, I'll show you a picture of a mature crepe myrtle in here. Um, they can really look nice in the winter, uh, especially as they get mature. And then lastly, trees for texture. Um, something that's probably underutilized in the landscape so we're talking mixing coarse fine textures there's a, a lot of different directions to go with this um, so trees with large leaves magnolias tulip poplars red buds anything that that's going to have a large bold leaf on it uh, is kind of what we're talking about there um, as well as plants with dense dense branching habits so zelkova um we're going to have some other ones most conifers are going to be densely branched hollies um something that really has a a heavy look to it when it's in the landscape um these are going to kind of have their own little category and they tend to mix well with the next one which is fine textured plants um so kind of like the japanese maple on the right side of the screen and the um the I think it's a tiger eye sumac on the bottom. Those both have kind of a fine frilly texture. Um, so Japanese maples, um, needled evergreens, so pines, um, blue atlas cedars, daydar cedars have a very fine needle branching structure, um, as well as things with slender branches. So dogwoods, snowbells, a lot of these slower growing trees can really have a nice um, light branching structure. And then plants with dissected leaves. So um, there's a waterfall Japanese maple um, kind of on the upper middle picture. Uh, those can be really nice to throw in the landscape, especially if you have some heavy coarse plants that's really going to lighten um, everything in your beds. And then a note on mixing textures. Um, you can definitely use coarse, bold textures in masses and then fine textures in masses. But a lot of times we want to mix the two of them. Isolate is really good about showcasing a lot of these, um, especially on their website. And they have a calendar out there where they show their beds of large trees juxtaposed with each other to, to give you an interesting bed, something that kind of wants to draw you into the landscape uh, instead of just sit back and look at it. Uh, one rule of thumb, um, many reasons to plant a tree. If you can boil it down to why we're planting the tree, uh, we can really get right to what options we're looking at. So just, just asking yourself, what is my goal in this tree? Um, is it to stabilize soil? Is it to add color to the landscape? Um, or is it multiple things? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about specific um, traits of trees that we're looking at. Um, so there's a lot of shapes. There's way more shapes than I can list here that you can go into trees, but just some interesting shapes. Um, we use this when we're describing trees, um, especially more specimens and, and unique trees. Uh, so columnar trees have become really popular in tight landscapes. If you look at that middle picture, um, this is actually in Midtown. Those are slender silhouette sweet gums. Those are getting close to mature height, so they'll get five, six foot wide, and then 20 to 30 feet tall. And you can see they're growing great right along this building. So tall, slender, columnar plants, um, a lot of evergreens are columnar, boxwood, holly, they can all have columnar shapes, usually vertical and narrow. Um, pyramidal, I don't really have a good picture of a pyramidal tree on here, but um, thinking of Leyland cypress, green giant, 
um, Nellie Stevens, Holly. Those are all going to have a very pyramidal shape. Um, some people call it a Christmas tree shape, and, and those can really stand on their own in the landscape. Oval rounded plants. Uh, a lot of times we're going to talk about this like a tree that's shaped like a lollipop, so a stem and a very distinct top. Um, Bradford pears, that's why those were so popular for so long. Uh, you're going to have an oval rounded shape. The lower right picture, um, there's kind of more of an evergreen. Now, this is a ficus or a. Um, Sorry, a ligustrum, which we really don't sell a lot of nowadays, but that's going to be a very rounded, uh, a rounded tree. There's quite a few they've bred to be oval rounded uh, that can fit in a bunch of different spaces. Vase-shaped plants, so these are plants that tend to be narrow at the bottom and wide at the top. Uh, on the bottom left, there's a, a row of Zelkova along a street, and this just shows how uh, tight of a location these vase-shaped trees can go into. Um, these are really going to branch high and then go out at the top. So these vase-shaped trees usually allow you um, a place to walk under, a place to drive under, while still being allowed in a pretty tight bed. So really good use. Zelkova is kind of a quintessential one that does a vase shape. And then lastly, a weeping tree. Um, so these can be really uh, different. They can be varied. Uh, we get weeping pines, uh, weeping cedars, weeping Japanese maples are really popular. The key thing with most weepers is they tend to have a limited height. Depending on them, I mean, weeping cherries can get large, 15 feet, 20 feet sometimes. Um, but something like a weeping Japanese maple, you're looking at 6 to 8 feet top, and then you get a lot of width out of these plants. Uh, again, this is going to be more about texture. And just kind of, I have a couple pictures here. Most of these are showing plants in, in tighter beds using the shape. Um, in the top right, that is espalier. Some of you might be familiar with that. That's kind of more of a, a topiary style of pruning. If you have, um, say, a wall that you want to plant up against, you can espalier lots of trees. This is a, a parodia or an ironwood. We see apple trees and fruit trees espaliered, um, even magnolias. So that, that is a different type of shape um, that you can do. Um, and then below that, there's um, some crepe myrtles, and then with a rounded evergreen kind of showing um, how we can play with these shapes next to each other. Okay, so sizes and scale. This is probably um, the, the big thing we use to narrow down plants for people. So knowing how big of a plant, uh, this goes back into looking how much space you have in your site. So large plants, uh, the biggins, as we say around here. Uh, reaching over 40 foot tall, some of the trees we have can, can get 80, 90 foot at mature size. Um, so these you really want to know where you're putting them uh, and know that they're not going to engage in a house or a structure. Some of the biggest tulip poplar can easily get 60, 70 feet. Um, Dawn redwood, that's another 60 footer. Leyland cypress, um, 40 to 60 feet. And then oaks, um, typically some of the biggest trees in our landscape can be oaks. Any, any number of those trees, they also tend to be fast-growing. Mid-sized trees, um, 15 to 45 feet. This is a, a pretty big range. We're talking just about everything that's going to be front yard tree or has a little bit of space, maybe not right up against your house. This is going to be a lot of river birches, maples, red maples, um, magnolias, um, zelkovas, green giant arborvitaes, um, a lot of hollies, a lot of other trees will fit in this mid-size range. And then small, uh, so 8 to 20 feet, these are going to be front yard trees, front bed trees. Generally, these are going to be low enough to go under a power line, uh, which is a real common request. So we're talking Japanese maple, uh, crepe myrtle, which is uh, shown here to the right with our dog Lily, just for scale. Dogwoods, red buds, cherries, crab apples, fruit trees. I, I would say the majority of trees uh, ornamental fit into the small category. And then the next is dwarf and miniature trees. Um, so four to ten feet, most of these are specimens um, really used for tight spaces where you want a scaled down version um, of a large tree. So Japanese maples um, will be scaled down versions of, of red maples in some cases. Dwarf varieties of any tree. Um, I do have a dwarf redbud back here to the right. That's Don Eagolf. Um, I want to say averaging around 10 feet, so, so pretty small for a redbud. They'll stay petite. Weeping varieties, like I said, um, really a lot of weeping trees. 
Japanese maples, um, weeping pines can all be be kept small, uh, as well as some crepe myrtles. So now we're getting crepe myrtles bred to stay between 4 to 10 feet. These are great for putting a crepe myrtle near your house without having to worry about topping them or trimming them off of the building. Uh, and, and just a note on scale here at the bottom, a lot of times we can use the scale of that tree to accent our, uh, our landscape or our house. So um, if you have a larger property, a, a larger house, um, a lot of times we'll use larger trees to kind of help accent the scale of that. Um, now, if you have a smaller lot, you know, a lot of lots nowadays are an acre or less. Um, smaller front yards, if we use smaller plants in general, it won't really throw off the scale of what you're doing. So if, if you have a giant tulip poplar in front of a small single-family house, it's really going to throw off that perspective, uh, and it's going to look kind of... Um, unappealing as that tree gets big. Um, the picture I here have here to the right, I kind of used for scale. Um, this is a crepe myrtle. It's probably about 12, 13 years old, and this is a Natchez. Some folks don't take into consideration how big some of these varieties can get. Natchez will get 25 to 30 feet, so you can see the dog Lily there. She's probably only about two, three foot tall. This tree has trunks probably about six to eight inches across and it's easily 20 feet 25 feet tall so just knowing how big this tree is going to be is really going to help us in the long run um, a crepe myrtle like this up against a house is definitely going to cause issues so having them out on a field is shown here um, and then it also shows us how pretty that bark can get as they get older and larger so if you let these trees get big and limb up um, you get some winter interest out of it uh, and then we're just going to kind of jump into something we've touched in on before, just general planting and maintenance. Um, we are right in the best season to start planting trees. We've had cool weather. Um, we've had a lot of intermittent rain, which is just perfect for keeping the soil wet. So right now is the best time to come out, get trees, get them in the ground, um, and have them basically be ready for next summer. Spring, you know, if you just can't do it this time of year, um, planting in early spring is your second best bet. Just, uh, I, I definitely recommend avoiding midsummer. You're just going to do a lot of work um, watering and, and uh, chasing these plants down with maintenance. General watering, if the soil runs dry, um, just make sure you can get water to it for the first year, uh, especially right off the bat, be able to water that tree for a few months. Um, and then if we start having dry weather, uh, be able to get water to it. Fertilizer, you do not have to fertilize, but um, usually spring and fall are good times to fertilize. You can fertilize when planting, um, but I usually try to do this when the weather's cooler so we're not stressing that plant with new growth. I usually try to minimize my pruning for the first year. Um, if you have any damaged branches, dead branches, uh, you can prune those off and that can help that tree recover. But but generally, if you don't need to, I don't recommend pruning. It's not really going to help much uh, right off the bat. Uh, and then lasty, lastly, soil amendment, kind of the key to success when planting around here. We make our own earth mix landscape soil conditioner. Um, it's a great product and it can really go a long way uh, for amending the soil. And, and I have a basic rate that we go by down there, uh, which is one bag of our landscape mix. We'll do about 15 gallons of plant material, so um, three five-gallon plants, one 15-gallon plant. You're going to mix that 30 to 50% with your existing soil and fill that back in the hole. Um, just a picture down there of our, our new uh, perennial house, so something for you all to look forward to coming in here to shop. We are definitely full. Uh, one last fun fact, um, most trees will become established within about a year, give or take. Um, some are faster than others. Um, this period is just um, to allow you to pay attention to water and fertilizer just to not really take a big um, break on that plant in case we do have um, hot weather, dry weather. All right, that's got most of my basics down there. Um, and we'll take some questions. I know I just kind of touched on the basics there. Let me pull the chat box up. Okay. Uh, so if y'all have any questions about really anything, um, if specifically with tree selection, um, let me know. And while we're waiting on questions, I might just kind of mention some of the, the plants I have behind me. Here's a, 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 one of those dwarf specimen trees. This is a ginkgo called American. 
Um, typically, these only get about four to six feet tall. So even though ginkgos can be 40 to 60 foot trees, these are, are really kind of a specialty plant. So this would get down into your um, specimen category, dwarf category, miniature. Um, so if you like certain big plants, we might be able to have a scaled down version uh, for a small garden. Uh, we did get hemlocks in today. So this is one of those fine textured plants. One of the few trees that can grow in the shade and be evergreen. Um, so these are great to mix with uh, chunkier plants in the landscape, shade gardens where you need to provide a little bit of shade to, to deeper shade plants. Um, we really got a great crop in today. All right, so there's a question. Is there any issue with planting a tree right where another tree has recently been removed? Um, talking about a huge oak and they want to plant in the same area. Typically, if, if you can get that hole um, where you're going to plant um, the same depth as the, the pot you're buying and the plant you're buying and double the width, it should be able to outcompete where that old plant was. Um, a lot of times this means that you're going to need to uh, grind, a, grind a stump um, deep down in the soil or build up a soil bed. But if, if you can get a hole double the volume of the tree you're planting, um, you shouldn't have any issue. Definitely use a, a soil amendment or soil conditioner um, when you're planting where another tree was just so that you are giving it the nutrients it needs, um, but shouldn't be too much of an issue. Uh, also, another question, thoughts for replacing a dogwood on a busy alley. You know, dogwoods generally tend to be a little bit of a weaker and slower growing plant right off the bat. If you do like dogwood and you have a higher traffic, there, there is a, a dogwood called Cusa. It, it's Cornus Cusa species, and that's an oriental dogwood. It tends to take um, abuse, uh, excessive sun, tougher growing conditions a little bit better than a dogwood. Um, there are, are alternatives for busy areas. I mentioned Zelkova. Uh, that's really kind of a, um, a backbone plant for street fronts. Uh, Chinese elms can be really good for streets, um, as well as ginkgos. Those will tolerate a lot of um, pollution and a lot of traffic once they're established. So um, there might be some hardier alternatives for, for that dogwood. I would definitely first look at the Kusa dogwood. Um, they'll be a little bit tougher, a little faster to root. Uh, and then also a question about the crepe myrtle. Um, from dark pink to now pink and white, Usually crepe myrtles won't just revert um, to some other straight species. The If a crepe myrtle is throwing on suckers from the bottom, those could essentially be a different color if you let those grow up. Um, so prune any suckers. Uh, the, the main reason I see blooms on crepe myrtles changing is, is one, just fading on the tree. Um, and then if they have... Um, a, a different level of sunlight or a different level of water than another crepe myrtle, it, it can make those blooms kind of fade in a, in a different way. Um, you might just try fertilizing that crepe myrtle um, in the spring next year after frost um, to try to make sure it holds those blooms a little tighter. But, but usually I see the change in color due to um, lighting differences. I've seen the shady side of a crepe myrtle bloom one color, and then the full sun side have a, a different shade of, of pink to white. Um, but, but typically, you're getting faded blooms when you get a lightening of color. Um, some people will opt to just cut those blooms off as they start to fade. That would be pretty typical. But, but just make sure if you get any suckers, cut those off, especially if they're from the base. Um, if it's grafted, it, it could be from a, a different variety. Uh, a question about planting ginkgos and pears. I, I don't know that that's necessarily um, a rule that you need to follow, but just touching on that, we only sell male ginkgos. M most people do not want the fruit of a ginkgo tree. They tend to be messy and, and they do stink. The only reason you would need to plant two is maybe to get more fruit production, and we don't even sell fruiting ginkgos, female ginkgos, on our lot. So um, the only reason... I could see you would need to plant two is for fruit, and, and generally people don't desire the fruit of a ginkgo. So um, you can definitely plant single ginkgos. I think they look great on their own, um, but, but planting in pairs is a good way to um, even out a symmetrical landscape. 
All right, y'all. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll continue to do these Bates Nursery Boot Camps as we go into fall. Again, as always, um, I'm Ben. I'll be here on the, the lot most days. Uh, we have several other uh, really good landscape specialists. So if you have any landscape issues, pictures, or just really anything you need to ask us, feel free to stop in, um, and we'd be loved, we would love to help you in person. Uh, again, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you later. Thanks.